Hello once again to What Saith the Scripture is a production of the Bethel Baptist Church in Prospect, Connecticut. I'd like to welcome you to the broadcast today. I'm going to take our Bibles, uh, and we use specifically the King James Bible because we believe it is the reserved Word of God for no other reason than that. i also like to draw your attention to the Book of Acts. The Book of Acts is a transition book from the Old Testament to the New Testament as a, the New Testament church began to grow and as the Lord directed his uh, people at the time. And it's, uh, it's an interesting book. But I want to draw your attention to Acts chapter number 1. And I'm going to read to you verses 1 through 9. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Lord, we ask you to bless your word today. Give us grace and understanding of it. May it help us to learn how we might apply it to our lives. And we'll praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, in that, uh, in that Acts chapter 1, verse number 4, drawing your attention there. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Now, the title of today's message is, The Things of God Are Worth Waiting For. And so we see here that the saying goes that something worth having is worth waiting for, and it's true. Young people, if they... Uh, withhold themselves from uh, unscriptural sex, uh, sex without marriage, uh, their marriage is going to be a stronger marriage. It's going to be a stronger bond between the two of them and, and instead of being promiscuous before marriage comes along. And there's uh, difficulties that come with the marriage at that. So start out right, young people, and wait and hold yourselves uh, until you're, you're married. Now, for the brethren, for those uh, who attend churches, a solid church is worth waiting for. The ruler at the wedding feast observed that Jesus provided the best wine for the last. And, uh, you know, waiting for the promises of God to come to pass is truly worth all the wait that's put into uh, the time consumed before the promise and, and the, uh, the anticipation being finished when the, everything comes to pass. So let's take a look at some of the promises that are worth waiting for in the scriptures. First of all, the birth of Jesus Christ was worth waiting for. In Luke chapter 2, verse 25, it says that, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. So here was a man, Simeon, in the temple, waiting for the promise of God, waiting for the promised Messiah to be born, and uh, he's waiting and waiting, and finally this comes to pass. Uh, it, it was worth waiting because of the person who was born here. And the Messiah, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, not just a Messiah, but the Messiah, the one that was prophesied redeemed, justified, sanctified, and glorified in this Messiah called the Lord Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. He was not only the Messiah, but he was also to be the mediator between humankind and the Godhead. The mediator, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, tells us there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 
So he was the Messiah, the mediator, and he's also the master. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 tells us about Jesus Christ, God manifested in the flesh, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So that generally throws out most of your science, your public school science uh, information that you've learned over the years about creation. All things were created by God, and by him all things consist. He's not only the master, the Messiah, and the mediator, but he's the magnificent one as well. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 5 says, Bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27 says, Behold, the heaven and heavens cannot contain thee, speaking of God's greatness. This one here that was born, this Messiah, God incarnate, God in the flesh, is the image of the invisible God, the express image of the invisible God. He's the one and the only one who made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life, heaven. That's an inheritance that can come only to those who are in the family of God. And they can only get into the family of God through faith in Christ Jesus alone. And he says he's the only one that's delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. For through his blood we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. So there's so much involved with this one that came who was born that day and it was worth the wait. And to underscore the magnificence of this one, it tells us in verse 16 of Colossians chapter 1 that he created all things. All things were created by him and for, him, and for his good pleasure they were created. By him all things consist. And not only that, but he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead. That in all things he might have the preeminence. Yes, this is he who made peace through the blood of his cross, to reconcile all things unto himself, to present us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. His birth was well worth the wait, for this one that came was to present himself a sacrifice for the sins of all mankind, and he is going to reign forever and ever. And I, and I compel you, I, if I implore you, and if I could compel you, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul. And I'm telling you, my friend, whether you're Jewish or whether you're Gentile, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe the scriptures, for in them you have eternal life. And now also, it, uh, it was wonderful because of the, the birth of Jesus Christ, the proof that it gave. It was the proof of God's love. John chapter 3, verse 16. Very familiar verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse John chapter 3 verse 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Imagine the being called the sons of the highest because we have faith in Jesus Christ. The proof of God's prophecies uh, was presented here in Luke chapter 24, 44. All things were fulfilled which were written in the Law of Moses and in the Prophets and in the Psalms concerning Jesus Christ. My Jewish friends, I, I, once again I tell you, search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And I'm, I'm not even telling you to look in the New Testament. I'm telling you to keep your eyes in the Old Testament. You'll see Jesus Christ there over and over again. He's not only the promised Messiah, but He's come already. He was crucified on that cross. He shed His blood for the remission of your sins. This is why there's no more animal sacrifices in the temple. You have to look to Jesus Christ and live. Plain and simple. The Holy Bible is the record of a king and his kingdom. No other book on the face of the earth even comes near the accuracy and the fulfillment of its prophecies. 
Every word of God is true and pure, and it shall all come to pass exactly as it is written. So look to Jesus Christ. You can stand upon the fullest assurance and confidence that every word of God is true, especially its truths concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. It was also the proof of God's power, the birth of Jesus Christ. Is there anything too hard for God, the Bible asks? Absolutely not. From the miracle of God becoming a man born of a virgin woman, to the miraculous sacrificial bearing of the whole of mankind's sins on his cross, to his miraculous rising from the dead, unto the power of an endless life, God has shown only a portion of his tremendous power. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Through his own death, he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Romans chapter 6, verse 9. Death hath no more dominion over him. And because of that, in verse 14 of Romans 6, it tells us that sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. My friends, come out from the law. That's such a burden to bear. Come under grace, the grace of God. The proof of God's presence was manifested there at the birth of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Listen, the scriptures tells us that Jesus Christ came unto his own. He came to the Jewish uh, people, and he says, but his own received him not. But to as many as believed on him, to them gave he power to believe on the, the, the Son of God, that they might have eternal life. John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. And then it also uh, showed God's love because of the promises that it brought to us. A full redemption is promised here. Uh, we don't have to be concerned. Uh, let me put it this way. We who are saved and who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is death, burial, and resurrection. And that's what we're trusting in. We have full assurance that we need to add nothing to our lives or anything to be saved. We know that because we put our faith and trust in what Jesus has done, there's nothing that we can do to improve on that. All we are asked to do is to believe what is written in the scriptures about Jesus Christ. There's a full redemption. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. And please write these references down from the Bible and look them up for yourself. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For in him, Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. You need no other person than Jesus Christ. There's no other person that can help you with the eternal salvation of your soul. For there is no salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. It also provided a finished work here. Completed work. People are wondering, how much do I have to do? How often do I have to do it? Uh, what about my sins that I commit? You know, what are all these things? But there's, it was the work of Jesus Christ that is finished. John chapter 17, verse 4 verifies this when it says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. This is the word of Jesus Christ himself. Nailed to his cross and with his dying breath, Jesus said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 says, Wherefore, he, because of that, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. There's no other way you can get to the Father. Jesus tells us in John chapter 14, uh, he says that no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Plain and simple. And this is the promised one your soul has been searching for. Isaiah 55 Verses 6 through 7 say, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And they need no, uh, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Are you looking for pardon? Are you looking for forgiveness of sins? Turn to Jesus Christ. He's your only hope, He's the only way. There's nothing you can do to pay for your own sins. And also, not only a finished work and a full redemption, but a future reign with the Lord 
is promised to those who trust in this one called the Messiah. Revelation 22, verse 5, the last book of the Bible, and there shall be no night there, speaking of heaven, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Go to reign with the king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. One day the kingdoms of this entire world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now think of that. One day that's going to happen. That means someone else has got authority over this world right now. Paul tells us in Corinthians that it is the devil, the God of this world. It's not the Lord God of heaven right now. But, oh, brethren, at this very moment, nations are rising up against nations. Our own nation here, America, is in jeopardy right now. But one day, the Lord shall be crowned King of kings and Lord of lords, and believers shall rule and reign with him throughout eternity. So the birth of Jesus Christ was worth the wait. The baptism with the Holy Spirit was worth waiting for as well. In Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it says of being when they were assembled together uh, with the Lord, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And they were. And it was worth the wait because of the closeness that it brought the disciples. These disciples were baptized by the Spirit into one body. They became the church. Here they were the church, and now they were empowered to go out and preach the gospel that was given them, that great commission, to go out and preach the gospel and to baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and to teach them whatsoever things the Lord had taught them. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And this is not water baptism. And whenever you see the word baptized in the Bible, it's not always talking about water baptism. But this is a baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is... You being placed into the body of Jesus Christ through faith in Him. Now, Jesus Christ being the head. Here, it says, uh, you know, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles. One body made up of Jew and Gentile. Whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Now, you may have some interests and hobbies as your same as some of your other friends have. But the one thing that binds us all together as brethren, as members of the body of Christ, is the Holy Spirit, which God has given to those who believe Him. He is the bond that keeps us close. We all have to have our own personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't get saved for me. I can't get saved for you. I need to believe on Jesus Christ. My wife has to believe on Christ to be saved. My children have to believe on Christ to be saved. All of you need to believe on Jesus Christ, your own selves, to be saved. No one can do it for you. There's no proxy here. But here, it's the Holy Spirit who indwells each and every believer that keeps us together. What is the difference between you who are saved and a lost person sitting in the same pew next to you uh, it's the Holy Spirit that's in you. He's not in him. He can't be abiding in the unbeliever. So here you have the difference, and that's what binds us together. The Spirit's arrival was worth the wait because of the comfort that he brought. In John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said that the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Things such as John chapter 14, verse 27, when Jesus said, Peace I leave you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Folks, you can't find that kind of peace in the world today. And also, the waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit was worth it because of the courage that it brought to the believers. Acts chapter 4, verse 31 says that when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Now, I know a lot of our friends uh, from various uh, denominations, they think that uh, if you speak in some type of uh, language that you can't really understand, that they call that speaking in tongues, is the proof of the Holy Spirit's uh, power in dwelling you. Well, the fact of the matter is, in Acts chapter 4, 31, says that they spake the word of God with boldness, and the word of God was understandable. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, 
all the Jews that were assembled in Jerusalem, when they heard these men speak, they heard them speak in their language, and it names the languages. So let's pay attention to what the Bible has to say and follow the truth as the Holy Spirit directs us in that path. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. They didn't speak foolishness. Paul also said in Philippians chapter 1 verse 20, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. So this brought boldness. When the Holy Spirit's power is manifested, there's boldness in preaching the word of God. Someone down on the street corner in the city preaching the word of God, there's boldness there because of the Holy Spirit. Someone's preaching a message like this to the general population. There's boldness in there uh, from the Holy Spirit of God. The disciples were fearful before this took place. And they were hiding from, from everyone. And after the Holy Spirit came, they were, they were out in the public preaching the Word of God. And it also was worth the wait because of the converts that were brought in. And people getting saved. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And in verse 47 says, Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So it was worth the wait for the Holy Spirit. It's also going to be uh, worth the wait to get our redeemed bodies, the new bodies that God has promised us. Romans 8.23 tells us, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption of our body. So we're looking for a new body, a one that doesn't get sick, one does not fall apart, one does not age, and then we're going to be just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, because we're going to be patterned just after, like his body. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 tells us that our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. You won't need cosmetics, you won't need surgeries or anything like that, but these bodies are only going to be provided for the redeemed. Romans 8 22 says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And Romans 8, 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It was worth the wait because of its purity, the body. It won't be able to sin. It won't be able to suffer corruption. It will be just like Christ. And also because of its power, the power that it has over death. 1 Corinthians 15, 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. That's our new bodies. And this mortal must put on immortality. Again, our new bodies. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. All right, the bridegroom's return is worth waiting for. Jesus promised he was coming back. And the church, well, let's put it this way, a believing church is looking for his coming again. James 5, 7 tells us to be patient unto the coming of the Lord. And then he tells us to, uh, it's worth the wait because... The reception that's awaiting us. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. says, Wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things ye shall never fail, uh, never fall, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What wonderful news it is, my friend. You don't have to worry about an earthly kingdom. You don't have to worry about the United States government. Look for the government of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you're going to rule and reign with him forever if you have trusted him as your personal savior. And also because of the reality of Christ's presence. Jesus told his disciples that he would be with them always, even unto the end of the world. Now he does that by the Holy Spirit who resides in every born again believer. He comforts in persecution. He brings conviction of sin leading to repentance. And he guides the believer to all truth through the written word of God. He is the Christian's greatest friend. Without him, we can do nothing that would please God. 
But there is coming a day, a day unlike any before, when we shall see Jesus face to face. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, and to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. It will be worth the wait because of the rewards for the faithful. Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. Revelation 22, 12. And because of the new residence for the believers. Jesus made a promise to those who love him that he was leaving to prepare a place for them. He said, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That place is his Father's house, wherein are many mansions. John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. You have never seen or heard of a place like the Father's house. But if you will only believe Jesus' words, then you shall ever be with the Lord and you will dwell in that land. Now, my friends, Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12 say, The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. This is one of those times. We're preaching Jesus Christ crucified to you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify himself and peculiar people zealous of good works. Listen, in the last days, willingly ignorant scoffers walking after their own lusts will be mocking believers in the word of God saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 5. Don't be like them. Keep diligent guard over your faith. Without wavering, be patient and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. My friends, this word of God is true. I pray that you will believe it. I pray you will search it out yourself and be saved today. Again, this is Pastor Ed Bufar at Bethel Baptist Church in Prospect, Connecticut. Please call us or visit us anytime. Thank you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound.